Welcome back to Tabletop and Beyond. I am your host, Justin. I'm here with Jason and a very special guest with us today, Mr. Vince Venturella. Welcome to the show. Hello. Very good to be here. Uh, happy to be with both of you. Yeah. Good to have so, you. So, yeah, yeah. You are a man who probably amongst our audience needs little introduction. Uh, I think most of our folks in the Discord have learned how to prime their models from you. <laughs> I have sent I have sent that video to so many people in our Discord. Uh, it's it's kind of hilarious at this point. So everybody talks about you know how how we're using our painting techniques. So um, for those of you in our audience that don't know who Vince Venturella is, um, he is the creator of the hobby cheating video series he also hosts the weekly warhammer series he is a master miniature painter that teaches all over the country um at many of the different cons and um other other places as well and uh i, I don't know what don't you do vince what don't you do well and also i mean relevant to this one i write books with uncle adam right. from tabletop minions uh so and then you know that's obviously gonna be pertinent to the conversation but you're right uh idle hands are the devil's play thing so you know you gotta you gotta stay busy and uh i don't have kids and i'm a, i don't sleep that much so there we go lots of lots of time to fill yeah that's <laughs> question but do you do you obviously play games because you wrote one that we're going to talk about today so yeah it, it's good to see that uh it's you know not just the uh, hobby inside of the industry too but also uh you know playing the games and throwing dice on the table so we'll talk about that today excited to get into that Hundred percent. I mean, I've I've been a gamer for my entire life, long before it was cool. It's become very trendy to be nerdy now, but uh, like many, I I my nerdiness goes far back uh, to long before it was the 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 cool thing to do. It didn't it didn't get you in with the cool kids. Yeah, uh, and I can talk about all that later on. But yes, yes, very much so. Yeah, OG I think cool you kid. you could say that you know that my gaming goes back as far as when I had to actually hide my source books from my parents. Because they thought I was, <laughs> sure. you know, <laughs> it'll say tannic panic. The deeper things, yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, my my gaming only goes back to uh, after I got married, and I really got into it. My wife said, "You have been hiding this inner nerdiness from me," and I was sold a false bill of sale. Oh boy! You know? so, <laughs> <laughs> I said, "Ah, well, you get what you get now." So, um, but also, I wanted to say, Vince, congratulations! Four hundred hobby cheating videos recently. Um, that is, that is an impressive feat. That is a lot of videos. It is. And of course, you know, that's just the hobby cheating side of it of, you know, obviously mm -hmm. there's, we've, we've also done, uh, you know, we weekly now every Wednesday, I haven't missed a Wednesday in nine years. So I, wow. I have some pride over that. Uh, you know, and I, I do have a schedule that requires me to travel often for work and stuff like that. So it's always planning around it and lots of things like that. And, and, uh, fun times, but I mean, I take it, it's just, I take it seriously. I take having this channel seriously and, and I want to respect the people who are nice enough to, to watch my stuff, to like my stuff, to share my stuff, to do everything like that. Um, it means the world to me, every view, every person, every comment, every like is, is incredible and still, uh, uh, you know, truly rewarding to me to this very day. Um, so I, I feel like it's uh, the, the, uh it, it comes from a place of love is what i'll say like i love teaching i love sharing information all that kind of stuff and so that's this is really the outlet um when i was younger i won't say how young because it's probably too old but i watched pump up the volume Are you familiar with this nice. movie this christian yes. slater classic okay <laughs> very good so i classic. watched this absolutely this is like this is an all-timer for me okay i watched that movie like a hundred times and you know, he has this pirate radio station. And when I was young, I'd be like, this is it. This is what I want to do. I want to make a pirate radio station and talk hard, you know. Uh -huh. And, and uh, I've, I've, I've probably softened some in my uh, need to get in sort of pick fights or, or touch sensitive, you know, issues. But uh, then they created YouTube. And I was like, oh, never mind. No more. Don't even watch the video <laughs> anymore. We're good. We're all set. Even better now. So That's there awesome. You go. That's awesome. Well, uh, I, I I'm gonna give you a little bit of my fanboy moment here. I told you I was gonna do it before the show, but it was 2018. I was running a Shadow of the Demon Lord RPG campaign, and I wanted to start putting miniatures on the table. And as I was looking around miniatures, I said, "Well, none of these come painted. Like this is kind of weird." 
you know, because the ones I really liked were coming from Games Workshop that worked for that setting, right? And so I said, well, I've got to learn how to paint. So um, I decided to take a class at the Nova Open, not play there. I'd never even played any of the war games that were being offered there. But I decided to take a painting class, and I think the very first one I took was Battle Damage, which is a hilarious first one to take, right? Yeah, Battle sure. Yeah, like jumping right into the inter intermediate advanced techniques there, right? Um, yeah, yeah, that's very funny. <laughs> battle damage from uh, from your, yours truly, right there, right, uh, Vince, and um, and uh, it was an like an opening moment. Like I I remember like rubbing my finger over the knee pad of that marine after we painted it, thinking that there was going to be texture there right with the way that it looked and it was just like wow this is great but there was a moment in there where you're like hey everybody i'm vince venturella maybe you know me from my hobby cheating video and i was like i, I have no idea who this guy is you know <laughs> <laughs> that's <laughs> you know? very funny <laughs> i just i signed up because there was like space in that one class and i was just sure. excited to do anything painting i spent the whole weekend taking classes just to you know because i was loving it and it was just so funny because I'm like, I have no idea who this guy is. And then, like, I go back, of course, and, like, look you up. And I'm like, oh, my gosh. Like, look at all this stuff, you know. <laughs> but it was pretty funny. So that was I, my, that I was my first experience with your class. That's why I always say you probably know me, but if you don't, and then I introduce myself, right? Because you yeah. never know. Like, it's a con. People just sign up for classes. And it's not like I'm so – I mean, I have no delusions about my my pseudo-fame in the miniature nerd space. Like, I'm not – George Clooney or something, right? Where if you're like, you don't know who George Clooney is, what's the matter with you? Or, you know, whatever, pick your favorite celebrity, right? Like, I'm not that. I'm just some guy, you know, I'm just some guy in a basement. That's all I am. It's nothing special. So I, I if I can teach and, and make the class fun, then hopefully it doesn't matter who I am, right? Yeah. It just it just matters that the class is well, good. Most of us are just dudes in a basement anyways, just having a good right. time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Totally. exactly. Totally. So... But we are, um, you know, we're, we're happy you're here. We're happy you are such a renaissance man because we um, picked up your Majestic 13 game and we've been taking a look at it and we are excited to talk about it. So, but before we get to that, let's get to our uh, Geek Week. So Jason, why don't you kick us off with Geek Week? Dude, I finally played Cities and Knights, Catan Cities and Knights. Like this is, this is one of those games. I had a game night at a buddy's house this weekend. This is one of those games where like people are like Catan, right? You've probably, everybody's played Catan, right? Like I've played it it's, once. It's in the my game, life. the game of our generation, the greatest yeah. game of our generation. That's what the truck at Gen Con says. I have right. <laughs> That's right. I, I played it one time in my life because every time you go to a board game night, everyone brings all their board games. It's like, hey, there's Catan. Hey, let's play Catan. I'm like, yeah, yeah, we've all played Catan. Let's play a different game. And so sure. I like never got it on the table. Well, finally, it, uh, this this time uh, uh, a couple people didn't show up and it was just three of us and I'm like well what do we got to do and this one guy's like well i only have like another two hours and so they're like well we could play cities and nights so i was like yes let's play cities and nights and so we played it uh and uh fun game man uh, you know it's the kind of game that uh doesn't have a crazy theme on top of it so it's not a theme that would scare people away like some of my other games right like deep madness or or um you know or the arkham stuff or any of that that you know my my wife kind of steers steers away from that stuff but uh, uh i i'm just glad that i finally got to put that thing on the table and the cities and nights expansion i've heard a lot of good stuff about um and uh you know i enjoyed it i i would say i can't really judge it relative to the other expansions because i obviously haven't played the game much but but fun time have you played cities and nights justin I haven't. I've only played oh, the base well, game of Catan. Too bad you weren't so, there. Yeah, I need to try it. Yeah, I need to try it. What about you, Vince? Have you tried that game? Pure cones of Dunshire are only for me. <laughs> yeah, that's I stick to. Yeah. Uh, it's about no, the I cones. Mean, it's about the yeah. cones. Civilization. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, I'll be honest. Catan doesn't interest me that much. I just don't like it. I played it one time and never really stuck. Uh, I mean, this last, like, was it two weeks ago? Obviously, I, if you'll if you'll allow if you'll permit me to go a little bit farther back than just the last week, since I wasn't here last week, yeah. so yeah, That's, yeah, exactly. Um, but we we got a good game in of one of, of like my favorite board game of all time, favorite second favorite doesn't matter. It's in there. It's in there, uh, which is Dune. So this is the original Dune, mm -hmm. the one that was uh, printed in like seventy two originally, and then was recently re released. Not the dumbed down, simplified version for babies. The one that's actually still like, that was just the, the true re-release. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, this is one of my favorite games ever made. It realizes I'm a huge Dune fan. Um, read the books and yeah, watched all the movies. The original David Lynch movie, I have like a unreasonable love for. And um, that is unreasonable, Vince. Oh, I I own the <laughs> I own the bootleg VHS long cut that was only shown in Mexico with all the extra footage before the edit. <laughs> when I say I'm a fan, okay, back off. Like I mean. I, I could we could just start right now and the rest of this podcast could be could be me just reciting the dialogue from the David Lynch movie in order, in character of everything. OK, but let's not do that. <laughs> but anyways, the point is, is that I play that game. If you haven't played that, that's like a tremendously good, highly political board game. It's absolutely fantastic. Lots of orthogonal win conditions. Mm -hmm. uh, nice. Every every. Like every faction has their own specific way they're trying to win. Some of yeah, them directly yeah, yeah. are against no. each other. Some aren't. It's very, 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 very political. You can sell any piece of information. So like everything's for sale. Everything's capitalism. Uh, it's it's fantastic. Like I cannot recommend it enough. One of my all time favorites. I tend to like those kinds of um, mm -hmm. political talky games. Like something where it's not where where you're. Your wheeling and dealing at yeah. the the table has some impact on your overall success, if that makes sense. Yeah, very cool. I yeah, I have, did you being a Dune fan? Have you seen the um, the Dune that never was by uh, Alejandro Jodorowsky? I don't know how to say that guy's last name. Yeah, Jodorowsky. Yeah, Jodorowsky. Jodorowsky. Did Obviously. you see that documentary? I did. Yeah, yeah. Oh. I mean, it would have been insane. Insane. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Like just acidy trip, complete Total. <laughs> lunatic nonsense. Yeah, <laughs> but I mean, I'm sad it didn't get made. It wouldn't have done well. It, it wouldn't have, but it oh would gosh, be yeah. a, like it would have bombed horribly, and then we probably would have never got the David Lynch one, which I would be sad about. Yeah. But it, like, it would have been a weird cult movie that I would be that I would have watched a hundred times as yeah. well. No, yeah. no yeah. doubt in my <laughs> mind. Okay. Yeah. If you hey, if you haven't seen that documentary, it's. You got to see it to see how trippy that guy's mind is. That's where he would have gone with it. Where he would have gone with Dune. And what he was, you think what he's picturing when he's reading that book, you're like, whoa, okay. Uh, anyway. He's got an imagination. I'll give it to him. Like, I like yeah. to think I have a pretty good imagination. Um, you know, like I, uh, I like, for example, I, I play lots of role-playing games, never use miniatures with role-playing games, hate miniatures yeah. with role-playing games. I'm a, I'm a total theater of the mind guy. Theater of the mind. Yep. Yeah, I mean, that just comes out of starting to play in the 80s when, like, that was just, I don't know, that was the, as was the style at the time. And, uh, you know, that's not a judgment, by the way. People can use miniatures. I don't care. It's, you do you, whatever makes you happy. But um, I like, so I like to think I have some competent imagination, but man, that dude, nope. <laughs> nope. Maybe it's yep, drug, nope. drug fueled, you know. There's a lot I mean, of drug fueled, weird, say, you know, late 60s, early 70s stuff out there. <laughs> Sure. Yeah. Sure. I guess yeah. that was do, late '60s. But yeah. Vince, do you like where uh, Dennis Vil uh, Villeneuve has taken uh, Dune? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yes. It's a. It's a. It's a fantastic realization of the the source material. Um, I mean, I don't know how deep you want to go on this. Yes, I have lots of opinions. <laughs> uh, we I said we like rabbit holes, Vince. Well, sure. yeah. <laughs> yeah, I appreciate all the I'll keep this simple. I appreciate all the extra focus on Duncan. Um that was a character that's mm. quite quintessential to the overall book mm -hmm. series. Mm -hmm. Um that was very short shrifted in the Lynch version. I mean, he shows up for like mm -hmm. 5 seconds, repeats 6 words and then disappears and then gets shot in the head. Um and you you don't get all of the extra good stuff with with him, right? Um so I was happy to see him to have have a have a much larger role. Um, I was sad to see the role of Dr. Huey diminish so much because I do like Dr. Huey as a character mm -hmm. and, and think he's really interesting and compelling. And obviously, um, uh, what's the name of the actor? Uh, I, he's from Quantum Leap. The guy who played him in 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 original David Lynch Dune was yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh gosh, Maxwell or name? something like that. I don't know. Yeah. Dean Stockwell. Okay, there Dean. It is. Stockwell. I got there. Yes, people yelling at your screen and your phone. I got there. Just wait. Slippy, okay. slappy, Samsonite. <laughs> yeah, was That's on the priest. So close. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Whoa, no, whoa. It's, it's been great. Uh, one of my favorite spinoffs of that is the 
um elmo um with the uh with the sister scene oh yeah i don't know if you saw that clip <laughs> i no. of course i did yes i am also <laughs> a huge muppet nerd all right okay. like that's another i have all of the seasons of the muppets uh, on DVD, I refuse to let those go. I have all of them included. I've watched the commentary tracks for all the seasons that had commentary. Uh, big Muppet fan. Uh, I wrote uh, like a four, like was it maybe four or ten pages as a joke. My, may I tell a quick story? Maybe, Absolutely. Maybe call this rabbit this is, I'm sucked in now. <laughs> okay, so I... We're going to retitle this episode, Ramblings with Vince. Yeah, sure, sure. It's just, this is You're getting me going, so here we go. So, Mr. Mephisto, he's a friend of mine, and he does this annual stream for, for mental health charity, okay? So, he, he streams for, like, 24 or 36 hours straight, mm -hmm. like, on mm -hmm. Twitch, yeah? Constantly. He's just there the whole time. And he yeah, has yeah, guests yeah. rotate in every hour. So, every there's, like, different hour blocks or two-hour blocks or something. I don't remember how long it is. But, basically, guests in and out from different channels and friends and stuff like that. So, I had a block and talked with him and hung out for a couple hours, and then I... I the the rerolling ones guys another aos channel were in after me so they came on and then i was listening to their their hour because i had just uh you know gotten off so i was listening to them talk and they were telling a story about how they had ordered some like plastic uh condition markers for a game yeah like plus one to hit yeah. or stun sure. or whatever yeah, yeah, you know yeah. this is what it was supposed to be they ordered them and when they got the the bag it just got a bag of plastic tokens that said like Muppets evolved. <laughs> that was it. It wasn't what they ordered. It was just a giant bag of plastic tokens that said Muppets evolved. Wow. Wonder what okay. that was for. And so they're discussing that. And, and then they were like, what, what game would this have been for? And so I was there and I was like, Hey, if you guys get up to this amount of donation in this hour, I'll write a game right for uh. <laughs> Muppets Evolved and we'll play it on stream and they did get to that donation level so I wrote like obviously I didn't publish this because I don't want to get sued by Disney but just like for funsies I wrote a 10 or 12 page game role playing game about uh, Muppets in the post apocalypse uh, like the, as, the, as they called it the handed ones had, <laughs> uh, had died in some form of apocalypse and now only those of the only the children of the fluff still roamed the 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 desert wasteland so like wow. mad max meets the muppets wow okay. and uh all of the original muppets had become like gang leaders and legends you know scattered across the country <laughs> you know so they, they had control of different parts of it like uh you know you had um you, you had just like different all, all the different like individual muppets being sort of dividing up the country and taking over and so mm. you, you know the rest of the muppets <laughs> had to find their way in this space so yeah there you go I feel like Cookie Monster would definitely be like based in Chicago somewhere, right? That makes like, sense, sure. Yeah, Midwest guy, I think. Midwest, he's, I think yeah. Cookie, for we, sure. We love cookies up here. Wherever, <laughs> wherever the famous Amos factory is, I think, probably. I don't know. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Awesome. Awesome. Well, do you have anything else you want to share for Geek Week, Vince? You, you, you do anything else? Playing a lot of games, you know. I, I play D and D every week. I played new 40k. Got the first new 40k oh. uh, 10th edition game in this last week, so that was a lot of fun. Very excited. Do you about like the, the new, new edition. rules? I do. I do. Yeah, I had a lot of fun with it. They've simplified things a lot, which I enjoyed. I I like simple, and mm -hmm. I want simple. Um, I, and it, this it felt pretty good. So, um, painting up some uh, a little towel force for that as well. So, kind of on the side. That's my that's my fun palette cleanser project in between. Uh, cool. just, just did actually my test model as, as of the day we're recording this. Oh, that's very cool. I mean, from what I see, I'm hobby cheating. The only model you paint is, uh, is an ogre, you know, like Correct. just over and over again. <laughs> just yeah. the same ogre. <laughs> He's right there. there He's yeah, always by my side. That's the right. guy. <laughs> mm -hmm. He's never far away. He sits right here next to me on my desk. Yeah. <laughs> that's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah, I'm I'm curious about uh, 40k tent. I kind of got into it when ninth came around, and I realized it's 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 too complicated for my smooth brain. I'll stick with AOS, and you know, and the and the 40k universe. I mean, the lore sucked me in still. So we play kill team, and um, sure, you know, it's a little bit easier on my dad's schedule as well. So Matt, totally you know. understandable. Yeah. yeah, I mean, we decided we're going to play pretty cash. Just use the indexes, play a thousand points when we play. You know, keep mm -hmm. it, keep it simple, yeah. um, and it's fine. We're 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 pretty pretty 
I don't actually drink, but we're pretty beer and pretzels, like if, if that makes yeah. sense. So. Yeah, very good. Very good. Well, my Geek Week consisted of me playing a lot of Diablo 4 with my daughter. Um, she's 16, so we've been doing couch co-op. And um, just before Diablo 4 came out, we were uh, running, you know, the, the final D3 season that they had. And we kind of leveled up our characters. And so as soon as Diablo 4 came out, she was super super into getting getting going so she's been playing a rogue class and i've been playing a barbarian class and we've been exploring the wilds of of uh the world of diablo so it's been it's been a lot of fun barb rogue classic classic fawford and the gray mauser combination always right? uh, always a powerhouse combo yeah 100 percent. that's great. yeah she she gets mad at me though because i die a lot and i'm like well what do you expect like i'm in the middle of all of it and she's just like shooting from far away you know sure. so. it's pretty funny because we'll i'll jump in on a i'll jump in a game remotely and i can hear her sitting on the couch next to you through your mark saying father father <laughs> father <laughs> like, oh. somebody's driving that co-op experience yeah exactly so but we're having a great time this is uh it's it's a lot of fun unfortunately my painting has suffered because of it you know and uh, uh that's why i put I video would... games down you can't paint and be like video games are the destruction of time but <laughs> my last diablo was diablo 2 when we were running oh, wow. you know hardcore that kind of stuff you know? so yeah. and that's that's been many years yep. now yeah cool. it's all it's all good We've, we we have a good time with it and i figure if i'm playing with my daughter it's not uh you know, it, it's not me just mindlessly sitting on the couch and, uh, you know. Oh, it's good. No, that's for sure. perfectly for justified. Sure. It's a good bonding yeah. experience. Legitimately. Yeah. Those those are exactly. good memories. Yes, that is a good use of your time. <laughs> definitely. Definitely. So, yeah, sounds like a pretty good geek week all around. Um, let's, uh, let's talk about our main topic, which is the Majestic 13. Right? So I had a, a background that I wanted to put up there that said I want to believe, but it wasn't fitting well, so it's very good. Vince, this is kind of apropos for our time right now. I don't know if you it watched is. the news do, lately, yeah. but you guys released the game, I think, within days of a U.S. military official a uh, whistleblower that sounds that, that may be the most legit whistleblower in the history of UFO whistleblowers yep. to step forward and talk about secret UFO programs that the US government has been doing for years now. So before we get into your game, we have to we have to ask the question, Vince, do you believe do I believe there's aliens? Yes. Yeah, of course there's aliens. Like, yes, of course there's life elsewhere in the universe. Like, <laughs> right. uh, like, yes, I mean, obviously, the universe is so impossibly large. Like, yeah. it is it is wild. Like, our, our, our piddly little human brains can't even comprehend, like, how big the universe is, right? Like, uh, like it, it's, it's, it's uh, life could be rare, life could be common, I don't know. It could still be very hard to find. We exist in, in a very short little span of time, like the hundred plus years we've been actually looking to the skies with any kind of like reasonable ability to detect what's out there um, is, is nothing. That's a blip on the 16 billion year history of the, the cosmos. Right. So that do you um, believe in UFOs here yes. on our planet? I mean, I'm open to it. I, honest, my honest answer is I don't know. Mm. Like, okay. I don't I, I'm not going to say like uh i definitely think it's all nonsense or i definitely think it's it's real i mean i know i believe that the government said we you know we we see stuff and we don't know what it is yeah, sure <laughs> like do i believe in unidentified flying objects that definition yes because the like military senior officials sure, uh, and yeah, tons of other sources yeah. have said like yeah that's all real we don't know what those are you know but like that could be time travelers or dimensional travel or yeah, space aliens. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. but let's not jump to conclusions here. It could be everything we covered on in search of with Leonard Nimoy. Right. Like right. it doesn't have to necessarily be aliens. Um, but yeah, yeah. I believe that, that the universe is a big thing and we only, we, we know very little of it. So I, I try to keep an open mind on all that, but it's, I I've always been fascinated by alien mysteries. Right. right? Um, like I, I mentioned the Leonard Nimoy thing, but that's very real. Like I grew up watching In Search of with Leonard Nimoy and I just thought that was like the coolest show. And then Unsolved Mysteries and X-Files and, uh, you know, all the way through to Ancient Aliens and everything else today. Right. Like 
I love all that stuff. I like, well, I could, we could do a whole pod. I could write a whole thing or we could go to a whole podcast on the money pit up in, uh, up in, in uh, Nova Scotia or whatever. I don't know if you're familiar uh -huh. with this particular little piece of lore, but love all these little weird things and places in the world. It's fascinating. So it's funny you mentioned Unsolved Mysteries because that is like my guilty pleasure. You said you've watched Dune like a million times. I yes, watch sir. Unsolved Mysteries all the time. And my wife always says, fold your laundry. You got to fold your laundry. That's the show that comes on when I'm folding laundry. And oh. the thing that I take away from that show is that I really believe that amnesia was going to be a real problem for us when we grew up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's the quicksand paradigm, right? Every cartoon, exactly. people are sinking in quicksand and getting hit by anvils. Then you become an adult, and it's just not as common. Yeah, yeah, amnesia everywhere in uh, in unsolved mysteries. Yeah. <laughs> I know, I love it. I'm just like, this is so crazy, you know. And the reenactors were like my favorite part of it too, you know. So, yeah. Anyway, but um, that was that was a little side tangent. But um, yeah. So I grew up in Nevada. That's where uh, my stomping grounds were, and my father was the hunter education coordinator for the state of Nevada. So if you wanted a hunting license, you had to take a, you know, a class sure. to get trained sure. and stuff like that. And he was the coordinator for all of those teachers, right? He worked for the state of Nevada, um, making sure that everybody got their materials and all that stuff. Well, one of his instructors was a guy named Don Kaminsky, and he was the head of security of Area 51. Sure. And out there just outside of Tona, Tonopah, Nevada. And all the time we'd be like, so what's out there? And he'd say stuff. We're like, what kind of stuff? And he's like, secret government stuff, you know? And, and yeah. you know, of course, we got the line, you know, if I told you I'd have to kill you, yada, yada, yada. Um, but it, it was interesting growing up in Nevada at the time because they closed, the federal government ended up closing all of the peaks that were around the Groom Lake Area 51 base for, like, you couldn't hike up there anymore because people were going up there with their giant sports telescope, yeah, or, you sure, know, telescopic sure. lenses and just snapping pictures of everything that they were doing down there. And, um, of course, no alien craft was caught on those cameras before they closed sure. the peaks. But afterwards, they were flying everywhere, of course, you know. Um, turns out they were, you know, doing test flights for the B-2 bomber at the time. You know, sure. and, and of course, to everybody, like, th that was a super unidentified flying mm -hmm. object yeah. because nobody had seen something, you know, in the in the stealth fighter as well. Like, nobody had seen anything like that. So um, it's just it's just kind of funny because I agree with you. I think that there are lots of UFOs that you that we don't know what they are, but doesn't have to mean they're extraterrestrial. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. Should should I lay down what exact why we're talking about aliens so much? Yes, first? absolutely. This okay. is the time. All right. So obviously this is the Majestic 13. It's the newest game from Uncle Adam and myself from mm -hmm. uh, Snarling Badger Studios. It is a uh, covert, uh, asym uh, asymmetrical skirmish war game, solo co-op and versus modes where you uh, lead a, a team of sort of uh, brave defenders of the earth. Uh, so you've got uh, a five member, you know, sort of military adjacent squad, highly trained special force, that's going out and hunting down alien monsters that are seeking to uh, sow chaos. Uh, it uses sort of a programmatic mission generation system. The uh, aliens all run on AI. There are different types of aliens. They all have their own AI. Uh, and then every so often, uh, a story mission will interject itself based on your sort of team rating as you progress through your campaign. And the uh, the the members of Force, which is the the name that's been assigned to the sort of alien intelligence behind this uh, by the governments uh, will, will sort of attack you, ambush you, mm. attack you in your base and so on and so forth. Um, so yeah, full, you know, like it's got everything you would expect you design your uh, design and build out your team, choose your faction, which provides different bonuses, pick your equipment. Um, you get to, there's a base building element to it. Um, so for people who maybe have like an XCOM background or stuff like that, it kind of can scratch that itch. As I mentioned, there's a full campaign mode to it. And it's 30 different monsters in the books, all with their sort of own unique actions. They all play very differently. So each one sort of represents a, a different challenge you're going to run into over the course of a campaign. So there you go. There's the there's the back That's of the, the napkin. Yeah. yeah. Very cool. So um, you, you hit on a couple of things that I think that we want to talk about first, which is like we're, we're the inspiration that you pulled from this. XCOM 
you know, X Files, I guess. Like, um, where, where are you pulling from a, a lot of this? Yeah, everything is really a short answer. Now, I'll, I'll, I'll be honest. There's not like I'm glad that that people that, like a lot of people said it scratches the XCOM vibe. Mm-hmm. I'm glad to hear that because I don't know anything about XCOM other than what I've <laughs> awesome. absorbed in like the zeitgeist from just it being a mm-hmm. popular game. Yeah. Um, it's just not a video game I ever played. Mm-hmm. Um, never have have zero experience with that game. But like I understand, you know, sort of what happened in it, and and I feel like a lot of those things are are just sort of what makes sense, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and the uh, so, but yeah, that X Files, Men in Black, Alien conspiracy theories, all this kind of stuff. The the you mentioned sort of Area Fifty One and Roswell and all of these mm-hmm. kinds of things, right? Um, but our inspiration was actually a different incident. So in the book, the uh the originating incident and this is like a quote-unquote real incident as it were um comes out of an an earlier alien crash that i find much more interesting than than something like roswell i think roswell just got sort of publicized and has has entered the the public consciousness Uh but in missouri there's a place called cape gerardo uh and in 1941 there was this very interesting situation where a craft uh, allegedly crashes there um two of the they're supposed to have three crew members, three aliens, two of them are dead. Uh, one of them is still alive. And a local priest gets a call from the sheriff and says, hey, we had an airplane crash. You got to get down here and deliver last rites to one of the pilots before he dies. It's a very religious town. It's a small town. Uh-huh. You know, this is the this is 1941. We're, remember, we're right pre entering in World War II. There's a lot of fear and trepidation of what's happening. You know, is this like some some German you know, operation or something like that, right? So the priest goes down there and he sees it's a crashed alien spaceship. And the sheriff and the other deputies are around and they're like, they, they're holding up the alien and like, you know, sort of taking pictures or like simple pictures of what they could at the time. And uh, he walks up to the alien that's still alive and, you know, performs the last, like, like Christian last rites over this thing. And then allegedly it passes away and the government shows up and kind of hushes up the whole thing. Um, and everybody sort of went along with it because again, it was right. Like this is on the eve of, of yeah. us entering into world war two. Mm-hmm. Right. So obviously the news very quickly shifted to Pearl Harbor and things like that. This is just a few months before that. And it's such a fascinating incident because this really stays pretty like the locals know about it. It's a story that if you grew up in that area, you're, I'm sure you were familiar with, but it really didn't get popularized until much later on when the, uh, daughter of the priest recounts to a reporter basically her dad's deathbed confessional like on on her the so on the, the priest on his deathbed he brings his daughter in and tells her this whole story because he had been sworn to secrecy at the scene and he hadn't he hadn't done it he was a you know, sort of, uh you know like he man of his word as it were yeah and but he on his deathbed he tells her the whole story she writes it all down contacts a reporter not too much longer and, and, and puts together this whole story. And you can read the whole book. It's fascinating. I just thought it was such an interesting place to start the story because in, in our imaginary world in, in, you know, again, cause this isn't like built off of anything real um, in our imaginary world version of this, that alien lives and then explains that like, he's, you know, what we would call a gray. Right. And mm-hmm. he's like, Oh, actually I'm some of the, I'm one of the last of my, my kind. We're fleeing here. There's some of us, I can get the rest of them together. But we need your help. There's an, there's a, there's this alien force that's coming. Hence why then they didn't just named it force. Right. And they're coming to earth next. And, and I, I can help you if you can help me. Right. And so mm-hmm. the governments basically get together with this little guy and they become the naturalized. And so the greys become friend and feed technology and, 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 it, and rapidly advanced technology over the next 50, 60, 80 years. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and that that ends up being the basis to form this cross oh, cool. uh, governmental public private partnership situation that is majestic thirteen the thirteen factions from across society um, mm. where people get drawn in to then go and fight against these alien monsters um, who are sort of the the vanguard force that, that gets sent out by by the larger alien intelligence to kind of like test the defenses and sow chaos and stuff like that. So there's thirteen. Um... 13 factions that kind of make up this NATO-esque uh, alien fighting force. What, uh, if you're just going to pick one of them, which one of those do you find the most interesting that you guys wrote about? 
Oh man, that's such an impossible. Which question. one's your favorite child? Yeah, which one's your favorite? Yeah, exactly. Right, like <laughs> your favorite. Baby. I, I, I am honestly legitimately happy about many of them. Um, and and like when I myself play, I often find myself very torn on sort of uh, which one I want to play because I, 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 like it sounds like I'm tooting my own horn. Like, hey, you're the one that broke the rules, dummy. I hope you like them. Um, <laughs> but like, but I just think that they're like, I, I just find their story compelling. So like uh, for, I'll, I'll, I'll say it like this, for comedy in naming award, I'm going to pat myself on the back for Oh Dear, yeah. which is the office of the Department of Extraterrestrial uh, and Alien Research. Uh, oh dear. Okay. Yeah. So it's, which is a division of the department of the interior, which is the people who oversee national parks, because yeah, that's uh, amazing. <laughs> where do you see Bigfoot and all these yeah, other alien yeah, things yeah. happening? It's always in national parks. Right. So finally the park rangers got together and we're like, all right, enough of this. Right. We're going to, we're going to, we're fighting back. Um, uh, so like, that's a, that's a fun concept. I, I enjoy, um, the the naturalized is the group of aliens that got brought in. So if you want to actually mm. play as the Greys, um, that's the the naturalized. Um, and then site ops is my favorite, my actual favorite. Site ops is a like, hey, remember those experiments that the government did to see if people could be psychic? Yeah, they worked. Um, they can. And so you know, this is like a this is an organization that uses uh, you know psychics and psionics to to fight the aliens. Um, who are also often psionic, by the by. Um, so yeah, that's the that's that's my favorite one. You you still only get one psionic team member, but I'm also a big fan of like Judge Dredd, if if that's you know 2080. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and obviously, like you know, Dredd's partner is a is a minor psionic. I love the idea of like minor psionics in an otherwise normal sort of uh, world. I just think it's like a cool concept. Uh, this is something that you uh, like. Total Recall and something like that plays yeah. around in the same space, yeah. right? Um, yeah, that kind of stuff. I just, I just think it's a neat idea, right? Um, so yeah, there you go. Side Ops will be my pick. There you go. All right. So when I was looking at the both your your battle report that you have online, and we'll put all the links to um, the announcements that uh, Vince put out as well as the battle rep in the comments below. But um, when I was looking at the battle rep, I got some real strong Frostgrave vibes from it more so than XCOM um, just because of the factions that you have and that you basically um, you know, you, you kind of put it together and then you, you're, you're going out and the way that the roles work, the way that the, you know, the, the activations worked and stuff like that, it really felt a, a lot like Frostgrave. A, a, have you played Frostgrave and B did that kind of come into the design a little bit? Some of that, um, you know, it's miniature agnostic. It's, um, kind of rules light that lets you play in the narrative space as well with miniatures, you know? So, yeah. Yeah. So no is a short answer. Not really. Okay. Now I have, I played Frostgrave. Yes. I, and I mm -hmm. like Frostgrave. I like the design. I think he's actually an amazing game designer. Um, and I have a lot, nothing but absolute respect for mm -hmm. Frostgrave and Stargrave as games. I purposely try not to ever draw on, you know, anything in particular, like, mm -hmm our process is pretty is is pretty set to to divorce us from any other particular game um because the way that we work is we start from a set of guiding principles which is like half sentences half word cloud but we write down five or six sentences wherein we're like this is the this is the core conceits of the game so like asymmetrical mm -hmm. was was one of the things right and uh like focus on ranged combat the aliens should be far more deadly than any individual person, uh, you know, like covert and uh, government, uh, you know, close ties to government and everything that will mean. Mm -hmm. Right. And so all the then all the brainstorming that comes out of those five lines or whatever the guiding principles were originally is then like then I just start scheming up like, OK, from these five things, what is the natural outgrowth of mechanics? Like a uh, uh, similarity is both Frostgrave in this game use the D20, which is fairly unusual in skirmish war games, right? Um, now yeah. that's a fluke. I, I use the D20 because it was the die I needed to use given the other things that my design was necessitating. Like I had originally actually wrote and written up the very first version uh, to like when I was sketching out the mechanics, it was using to use a D10, but mm -hmm. then that ended up just not working mathematically. And so it moved up to a D20. So again, stuff like that, it ends up being, I'm I'm happy for the for the analogy. I'd love to think I can mm -hmm. I can create a game that's as good as Frostgrave, um, which is just a tremendously fantastic game. So, so um, 
based on what you just described to us, it kind of sounds like you start from kind of some sounding bites and then you you form it as you go. Now that you, now that it's out, the book's there. You guys have spent you know a year or so kind of refining it. What would you say is a game mechanic in here that makes it feel different than others? Bureaucracy. So yeah. again, that grows straight out mm -hmm. of the of those original guiding principles because that's that fifth thing I mentioned, like government close to, close ties to government and everything that means. Because you've got 13 jockeying organizations and lots of different teams all within those individual factions, mm -hmm. right? Um, and and you've got ties with government. If you've ever worked with the government, you know that bureaucracy and red tape is like just <laughs> part and parcel of the gig, right? And you're talking to two but, guys who work in DC right now. So yeah. yes. Yeah, they yeah, <laughs> exactly absolutely so. know. <laughs> and, and and that's just it. It's not always bad. It's just it's necessity, right? Because it's just it has to be there sometimes to to manage the volume, right? Mm -hmm. And so the bureaucracy was such an integral part to the game in the way that it it, it rears its head in multiple points throughout the, the gameplay. Um, when you're initially going on your mission, you make a bureaucracy role to see if you got bad information, right? Like mm -hmm. what's different about the mission than what you were told? Like, oh, on the telephone game of the mission briefing, as it passed from like analyst to analyst to analyst to you, right? What eventually got changed? So the monster could be stronger or weaker. The situation could be different. The terrain could be different yeah. than what your, your advanced intel says and all of that, right? And then at the same time, when you then are done with the mission and successful in campaign mode, and you're now trying to like requisition new gear and upgrades and stuff like that, you've got to make a bureaucracy role to see like if you can get the thing you requested or if your request just kind of fizzled ooh, out. Yeah. yeah. Just disappears off into the ether. Right. That <laughs> yeah. uh, sits in somebody's inbox, never to be answered again. Tom so, Edna's so, table. <laughs> right. Exactly. So, so that kind of stuff to me is really critical because it makes you feel like you're, you're actually playing. I, I like mechanics that bring the narrative to life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right when you can get that sort of um that sort of synergy between uh the overall story you're trying to tell and then how the mechanics express that narrative because i i a lot of people see those two things as completely separate they'll be like oh i only like i you know i care about the fluff and the story or the thing like right like, i'm really into like 40k is a great example of this where people are like i love the lore or i care about mm -hmm. the game and it's like well no i mean the the things are they feed each other, right? Like you read about the big, awesome gun and then you play a mini. If it has that gun, it better be a big, awesome gun, right? Like that's, right. that's a cool thing, you know? Um, uh, like Gene Steeler cultists, little like secret covert markers they would place around and stuff like that, where they could just like pop up and get people in crossfires and be hidden and stuff. That's, that's emergent narrative, right? So I love that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What do you, yeah. um, go, go ahead, ahead Justin. Justin. No, I, no, you're right. I have a question about the aliens. So you, you know, right. I think bureaucracy I thought was really cool because it tied into the theme, especially mm -hmm. of you know a decentralized organization from thirteen different factions. Of course, you're going to have telephone game problems, right? As right. Intel shared between them, um, but with the aliens, where it's kind of like this alien force, you know, this force that has come and is uh, hitting the world. There's a there are several different types of aliens and and how those play together. So what are, you know, I asked kind of about the factions. Maybe I'll ask the same question with the aliens. What were a couple of the aliens you thought were the most interesting or unique that tied into the theme? Yeah, sure, absolutely. So there are, broadly, there are three different types of, well, there are really four, but there are, there are three different types of, of aliens, okay? So monstrosities who want to get in melee and just mm -hmm. like rip you apart and, and eat your tasty insides. Um, ravagers who are like ranged hunters who want to like be very careful and methodical in how they kill you. And then stalkers who are sneaky, skulky, you know, invisible type hunters in the dark. Right. And, uh, and then there's also the members of force cause they, they represent their, they only show up in the special missions. You don't just like randomly trip into yeah. force, yeah. Um, but they have their own way. They work They're They're much more like, they're more like you frankly, because they're like an enemy conquering alien military, right? Mm -hmm. um, but the the aliens themselves, uh, like the, mon the the sort of alien uh, monsters that you, you end up going against um, in most of the missions, um, were really, really fun to make because I thought about lots of classic movie alien monsters, of course, like, you know, and, and there are many homages 
to uh, classic alien monsters. I won't say okay. what any of them are, but I'll see if people can can guess. You know what's what. Um, but but like there, many of them are allusions. I, I suppose is what I would say to uh to to you know aliens we know and love from from popular mm, sure. media and science fiction and stuff like that um some of my favorites are like um i really like the navite warrior he's the one who showed up in the battle report ironically mm-hmm. i just i rolled him um and I, he's one of my favorites um based on a very classic thing uh and but there's also just like weird monsters just like really 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 weird like generally the weirder they are the more unusual they work, like the terraformer that just walks around and turns everything into dangerous terrain and starts causing damage and, and like makes it very hard for your people to operate with the terrain. It's just a lot of fun because it changes the way you want to play the game. Normally you want to get into cover. You want to hide. This guy's going to flush you right out of there because all that will just start killing you. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cause you get like, what is it? One D six. If you end your turn in terrain. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So it'll just start, start damaging you, but there's, there's a lot of fun throughout there. And the, the key was, and, and I'll admit it is some of the, like, you know, the learning curve for this is, is, is the enemy AI. One of the challenges when you write solo and co-op games is, is that you don't have a game master, right? I don't have somebody who can just be like, well, the dragon does this, right? Mm-hmm. And, and, and whatever, right? So you yeah, have to have yeah. some kind of AI for it. And so the, there's a general AI, and then that's going to map onto the, the alien that's going to then want to do, you know, one thing or another based on its uh its own sort of internal logic and that can be some of the biggest sort of challenge for for when when you first start playing that's the learning curve everything else is really really dead simple um this isn't it's not hard we tried to make it very logical Mm -hmm. Um, we worked a lot on the ai to make it logical but it's the it is the learning curve if there's anything yeah i like the designer notes that you have in the columns too Mm -hmm. like uh, you know for example with cover it's like look it doesn't have to be complicated if it looks like they're in cover they're in cover if not, yes. they're not. <laughs> yeah, famously. So, so I have the, the, the we always are going to design our books like that. I'm a huge fan of designer notes in general. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, like, I believe that the best way you can eliminate confusion in your rules, because there is no way to speak in language or to write language that is 100% clear. It just mm-hmm. can't happen. Right. Like, that's not how language works. We all, it's, it's not a precise yeah. enough. The pen is blue. Um, yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's, it's, it's not math. Right. And so, um, the, the clearest way you can then be is you have to write things in sort of rules language, but then we leave ourselves space. And that's always the way we lay out our books to have these side columns where I can just speak in normal. Hey, uh, it's basically just me going, Hey reader, let's just talk like humans for a minute. Okay. Here's yeah. what I intend with this. All right. Here, here is the clearly stated intention. Don't be a jerk. You know, don't be <laughs> gamey. Um, you know, this is what I mean. This is how you should play. And stuff like that. Yeah. And like cover, I think that I think the header on the, the cover section is I hate cover because I do. I hate designing cover in, in miniatures games. It's such a horrible, horrible rule because it's so obvious and feels so real. Like, yes, of course, you would you would get behind cover. Right. Like if, if bullets yeah. are flying. But it's so hard to educate because of the nature of line of sight and what you want to do. And you got to build your whole game around assuming that like people are going to be in this. And, you know, obviously, even video games have handled cover very differently. Uh, mm-hmm. and I would argue that the, the, my, all my favorites don't have basically cover at all other than hard walls. Like I am a bullet hell doom player from back in the day. Yeah. I am not a chest high wall mass effect or whatever that, I don't know if that, know if that was those games. Gears of War, Gears of War. There you go. That's yeah, yeah. yeah. Gears of War is like a, you're desperately in love with chest high walls that you move between carefully throughout the whole game. So, you know, um, yeah, I, I think that that kind of stuff is good. Just speak plainly. So, yeah. Yeah. So um, this has campaign mode yep. versus mode, solo mode, co-op mode, right? Which, I mean, I guess you could play all of those in sort of campaign mode if you want. Um, what? Where does this game shine? Is it in the P, is it, is, is it in the PVP? Is it in the co-op? Is it in the solo mode? Like where, where does this game, like I'm sure everybody's going to find enjoyment in, in, you know, maybe not everybody, but someone will find their niche. In you know, like I really love the co-op. It's amazing. But like, where do you feel this game really shines? I really think that the, the solo and co-op, but especially the co-op is really the, the, some of the most fun ways to play. Mm. Um, it's just a lot of fun to have two teams or to split up control of a single team um, with somebody and go in and, and play against these aliens and, 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 you know, try to meet these challenges because they are all, each alien is sort of a different puzzle of you're trying to like 
figure out the AI and what the thing's going to do and move appropriately. Yeah. And who do I have to sacrifice or whatever to get the alien to move where I want it to move? <laughs> you know, like, like you're trying to bait the alien into a particular move so then you can counter it and so on. And I think that is really where the game shines. You know, this one isn't really like the versus is there. It's there because sometimes people want to play against each other and that's fine. We always want to facilitate that, but it's really not the focus of this one. This is, this one is very much solo and, and co-op focused. Uh, but stay tuned. Our next game, you're going to have some versus fun for sure. All so. right. So let me, let me ask you about the campaign. Um, you said, you know, you, you play, you play a couple of missions and then once you level up, you, um, trigger an event or basically yep. a mission that you have to work through. Right. Um, that reminds me of war cry, right. With, uh, in the, in the first, uh, war cry, you had your convergence missions that you, yep. um, kind of had to play to get through to make it to the, you know, the next progression. Um, how many games, how many games would you say you need to play to finish the campaign? 18. It's 18. Okay. Eight, well, I mean, like, assuming you don't get horribly wiped at some point in time and then fail and everybody <laughs> dies and then, and all your clones totally go wrong because, like, there is, you know, we, people can die. It, it can happen, but that's okay. Yeah. But, you know, Majestic 13 has cloning facilities and stuff like that. And um, so you don't always get a perfect clone, but you get a clone. So they're, they're mostly, they're mostly okay. Um, and there are different, facilities you can get in your base and and rules you can take that will that will increase your chances of getting a good clone or stuff like that right or not dying um but yeah it's it, the 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 sort of normal you could keep going and fighting in programmatic uh uh um games after that but like 18 games is will get you to the end of the story arc okay. if that makes sense yeah absolutely and how long does a, like a normal game take you about 30 to 45 minutes usually it's not we try to write all our games so they play about 30 to 45 minutes yeah. I, 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 that feels the most comfortable to me i want to make it worth your time for like setting up the game board and the terrain mm -hmm. right if that makes sense yeah. like if it's a five <laughs> yes. minute game or a 10 minute yeah. game it's not actually worth your time to set up you know but i also very much value that like full-on war games that take two plus hours three plus hours you know like I mentioned that Dune game earlier. I love it, but that's like a five, six hour game if you've yeah. got a full full group of people, right? That is not a that's a night. Like yeah. you're you're like, all right, we're committing. Okay. Like a Twilight Imperium. Yeah, game it's a Twilight Imperium yeah. like a day and a half. <laughs> right, exactly. Like yeah. and that stuff's great, but like let's be real. That means you have to you have to have like a day set aside where yeah. your partner yeah. is like, Yeah, you're good. You you go game for the day. I've got the kids or 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 whatever. Just right? Shelling out brownie points, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Whereas with something like this, it's, you know, you can do it over a lunch break easily, right? Mm -hmm. Like that's, I, I want to make lunch break games, you know, that, that kind of thing. Yeah, that's cool. Um, Mark Wade, I'm also a comic nerd. So, I mean, which is like I said, like, look, when I say my levels of nerddom, there's really knows no bounds. <laughs> Mark Wade always famously said other writers write uh, comics that you, you can read when you're taking a number two. My goal is to write comics that you can read while you're while you're doing a number one you know he meant like he was trying to be really to the point and short right and and so like you i just had your wall yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah, but yeah yeah uh so but like but i but i appreciate that like his you know that the, like i want things to be uh worth it but but have brevity if that makes mm -hmm. sense yeah 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 so um, it's funny you say 30 to 45 minutes. That means if Jason and I play it the first time, it's going to take us like three hours. Yeah, like three hours. <laughs> so. yeah. Your first game may take a little bit longer, to be yeah. fair. But yes, that's, you know, I, I, we obviously we did a lot of play testing as we always do for, for the launch. Sure. And yeah, the, our, our average time was usually 30 to 45 minutes once we know the rules. Cool. So a funny story. The first time, so this is 20, what is it? Christmas 2018? Maybe. Yeah. 2018. It was yeah, Christmas probably. 2018. Yeah. We got AOS models because I had gone to Nova open and I had painted the models and I'm like, okay, well sure. now we got to play these. Right. Sure. And so <laughs> we played um, like, I think we had two 800 point armies or 500 no, dude, it point was, armies. It was 500 points. Yeah. 500 points. Weird. It took us three hours to play. Three and a half <laughs> hours. Four hours to play. Well, it was funny because our first term we're like, okay, all right. Um, this guy moves forward. Okay. He's going to attack. And we're like, okay, how do you attack? How do you attack? Sure, yeah, yeah. yeah. So we're like, <laughs> how do you attack? Yeah. But yeah, you know, once you're by doing, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So it was it was pretty funny because we we always laugh about how it took us, you know, 
the same amount of time to play a 500 point game as we were playing in tournaments later, you know, so. <laughs> playing 1,000, 1,500 point games later. Yeah. 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 So. That's, that's always the way it is. Always. Game, right. Yeah. 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 But, um, but I mean, for me though, looking over these rules, one of the things that, you know, I mean, <clears throat> we have our weekly war, uh, war cry segment that we do or not weekly, sorry, monthly, our monthly yeah. war cry, uh, segment that we do. Right. So we're, um, and you know we I, we help run tournaments for Warcry and all that kind of stuff. We play Kill Team, we play Frostgrave, we do this. So I'm used to now like being able to digest um, skirmish game rules pretty quickly. And yeah. one of the things that I loved about your book, and I'm actually going to pull it up on the on the screen here, is that we can kind of show. Um, <clears throat> it's um, by the way, Majestic 13. I think is an amazing call to the Majestic 12 document. Yeah, exactly. That's you obviously know, what we're referencing. So and another yeah. fun conspiracy theory. You'll there's actually a couple different conspiracy theories kind of woven throughout here, but yes, absolutely. Yeah, it's great. So um again, nice table of contents you got here. But the thing that I loved is a great little background. Um, do you just get into here and like look? I mean, it's super easy to read glossary, you know, you get down into examples of play, and here I'm gonna actually just pull on what I like right, right here are stats, right? Um, you say, okay, here are the stats. Here's the acuity, combat, dexterity. Like, it's really easy to digest. Like, I could, I, I was kind of just, like scrolling through this when I first got it, just to be like, okay, what am I dealing with here, right? Like, I just want to kind of um, just get a broad sense of what this is. And I'm like, okay, got it. Okay, got it. Okay, got it. Right? Like, I was finding myself not having to dig that much deeper because. It was very clear. It was it wasn't too complicated. It was simple and easy to digest. And I think that um, a new skirmish gamer could pick up this game and be playing within thirty minutes. You know, I really do. That's wonderful to hear, and and it really is always our goal. Like we want to be new player friendly. Adam and I both have a passion for you know bringing new people into the hobby. I think it's critical to all of us that we we keep bringing in new people and and. Whether that means bringing somebody over from an existing larger war game who's like, hey, you know what, I'm, I'm, I don't feel like painting another two thousand points or something. I want, I want to have fun and just paint up a, a war band or, or try some different systems. Or whether that means it's someone's very first time, you know, dabbling in the space. Mm -hmm. I want to make it something that they can ingest easy. So we actually put a lot of thought and time into things like the layout, the font, mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Like, I mean, I know it all seems stupid, but like we we really do think and talk about that stuff a lot mm -hmm. during design mm -hmm. to make sure that it's going to be like readable and we get feedback from lots of different editors and, and, and people. We have multiple editors who, who who work with the product and uh, who who also then provide us feedback of like, actually, this isn't clear enough. This needs to be like this and so on and so forth. So um, I will say like. I do like your font. I, it seems simplistic, but that is so good. Cause like I'll pull open my crack open my Warhammer 40 K core book and the fonts really small and it's fancy sometimes. And you're like, man, I feel like I've read this paragraph three times and I'm still working my way through it, you know? Um, but being able to, to do this, this is an example too, for, for those who are watching the video um, on the left here, we have, one of these um, designer notes, right? That basically talks about like, this is why is defense different? And, um, you know, so it's obviously calling out to to defense and, and, and why it's different than the other scores. And so, I mean, this is how this whole book is though, is like you, you get into it and you see these little designer notes on the side that really, really help clarify things. Again, easy to read, easy to find things. I don't, um, one of the things Jason and I talk about all the time, how um, RPG rule books, when you uh, go through them, you're like, why isn't the thing that we need to find where it should be? Like, it's always right. hidden in another mm -hmm. section somewhere else, mm -hmm. you know, and, and it's, it's just like sometimes they're hiding elsewhere. I didn't find that same um, issue with this with this book. Right. Like I the the stats and combat stuff they're all in the combat section which is where it needed to be you know and and right. um like it just uh it was it was simple and easy to use and i think that that serves it well as a nice skirmish game for sure that's fantastic to hear and and, and very rewarding because again it's, it's a it's a major focus i'm very glad to hear that yeah i think you're uh the other thing i struggle with a lot with um rpg books is some of them just have horrible indexes <laughs> yeah. uh, but this one i don't even need it because the glossary or the table of context 
tells you exactly where you need to go. Like mm -hmm. like Justin said, I probably read I read everything I needed to know to play, and I watched your battle. Well, I watched your battle report, and then I opened up the PDF, and in about fifteen minutes, I was like, okay, I could sit, I could sit down and play this game right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and like I, I mentioned, we have a pretty refined system for making these. Like, but by the time I'm getting to actual writing, so putting something into a, a digital document, right? It's gone through principles, outline, mechanic review, sketch, primary loop, you know, sort of pre-alpha testing, stuff like that. And then by the time I sit down to start writing, I actually, Adam and I meet weekly and we review everything that's written. And then we say, okay, is this clear? Um, do we, what do we need a sidebar here for this? So I'm actually writing the sidebars as I'm writing the rules, right? Like at that early stage, I'm, yeah, I'm good. crafting most of these things. So I know we're going to need space to, to give some mm -hmm. extra, to, to put some extra spin on this ball, right? We got to put some extra English on it, right? <laughs> this is a more complicated concept. This is going to require a, a deeper explanation. So we're, we're trying to, to think about that, you know, from moment one, like from the jump, that's part of our, our process. Right. Um, yeah, that's, that's awesome. Now I, I'm going to shift gears just really quickly. I know we're kind of getting up close to time, but I've, I've got uh, another question I have to ask you. This is a miniature agnostic game. You can play with any miniature you have. They could be 40 K models. They could be maybe not age of Sigmar models. That'd be a little weird, but um, you know, 40 K models, they could be, you know, all sorts of stuff. Yeah, heck Jason even showed me, a great Walmart container that had like maybe 50 pieces of army green men yeah, that yeah, you yeah. could use in there. You know? Perfectly, the perfectly viable. Yes. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> Boom. Terrain included. Terrain, Terrain included. soldiers, the whole, you got the whole shooting match right there. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you got four factions, you know, the yeah. different colors and stuff like that. So, um, but you know, miniatures agnostic. Um, you are a miniatures guy, even though you may not like them in your RPG. I mean, you know, I see a yeah. whole host of them behind you right now. Yeah, Have yeah, you yeah. guys put any thought into coming out with your own miniatures for this game? For this game, no. Because, so so here's the way we think about it, okay? Um, do these miniatures already, do the miniatures already exist in a wide enough availability? And military dudes and weird aliens is not a thing that the that the world is short on right now, right? Like the supply is high. Uh, we're we're yeah. we're good, yeah. right? You know, and and well, we actually have blog posts on the on the uh, majestic thirteen game, majestic thirteen game dot com. Mm -hmm. You go there, there are blog posts. We we you know regularly um, set up some different blogs. Yeah, exactly, and. So if you go into the news section there, you'll see some blogs. And in that post, we have um, like blogs about uh, how to, there you go, how to find alien creatures, how to find models for your teams, right? And and yeah. so that, like we, we say, hey, here's a bunch of things that could work. And we try to highlight lots of different manufacturers of different miniatures, you know, down from well-known stuff to, to much lesser known stuff um, and, and, and make it easy because there's just a bunch out there. Right. And uh, same for, you know, what we did for Space Station Zero and things like that. Right. Um, the, the the goal is always to make sure that people can can find this up. Now, if we ever do a game, the, the, the running joke, by the way, on Adam's channel is robot squirrels. Like we're going to make a game of combative <laughs> robot squirrels. I don't know where I don't know. I think maybe uh, VJ Moore for somebody originally started that. I'm not sure. But but whatever the case. Like if we did a game like that, then we would make, then we would, we would do miniatures, sure, right? Because unique. there's not, yeah. yeah, yeah. If we're gonna do something truly unique, so I won't say it's something we haven't talked about. Of course, we have the, the thing that I think is, and I mean, you, you probably are aware of this, but like making miniatures is really, 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 really hard, right? <laughs> like if you're talking about actually making production sprues. Mm -hmm. That is uh, such an affair. And like the chances of us just basically bankrupting ourselves is pretty high. <laughs> um, and I'm like, you know, not really about that life. Like, you know, this isn't, uh, this, is, this is like a third job for me. We don't, this isn't, this isn't, you know, where we both make our living. We do this for yeah. fun and because it's enjoyable. Um, but you, it would become a, a job very fast. Now, you know, maybe there's a middle ground where if we can find somebody who could work with us to make STLs or something like that. As 3D printing becomes more and more and more uh, sort of, I don't know what to say, um, 
ever present, I guess, yeah, in the I mean, world every day. Prolific. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, prolific, yeah. Yeah, and I I mean I totally I agree with you. I think that, you know, if you're going to be well, Kickstarter's all the rage for all these new mini games that are coming out, right? But we I mean, we've done episodes on our podcast about the pitfalls of Kickstarter and, you know, sometimes being a victim of your own success. Yeah, um, yeah. When it comes to that stuff and um sometimes you just need to be like Simon level like to be able to produce sure. those types of, those types of minis, right? That yeah, that's yeah. kind of what they do. But um, for for kind of a you know a niche game with niche models and stuff like that, like it, I, you know, I think an STL is probably a good middle ground for what you're looking at, you know. So, yep. Um, but yeah, but Vince, thank you so much for coming on the show. I do want to give you a plug, um, folks. Go to snarlingbadger.com. This is where you can get your copy of majestic 13 um in fact i think i went yeah I, I went here and then i ended up picking it up there was a link that will take you to war game vault there That's right. and um so i i just want to plug this as well you can get the pdf only for 14 dollars, and i was about to click that so that i could instantly review the game you know for our for our podcast tonight but then I looked over to the right, and nineteen dollars, only five dollars more plus shipping, will get you the PDF and a soft cover book with everything inside that you can have with you at the table. Which I very much appreciate physical copies when I'm at the table, and I don't have to play off of my laptop or iPad or whatever yeah. I'm, whatever I'm using. Um, having that physical copy is great to be able to um, cross reference rules and resources and things like that. So I recommend getting yourself the book and PDF because it's only $5 more. And, you know, um, it, it looks at, we, we've seen the copy that you have showed us on screen, Vince, and it's a great little, great little book to, to have on your shelf. So, yeah, we, we work with a really, like we work with Wargame Vault. They work with Lightning Source. It's a very high quality printer. They deliver high quality stuff. And that's, that's, we're, we're very obsessed with that. This game also has cards available to, uh, that mm -hmm. you can also buy. They're completely optional, nothing required, but they, yep. like right all there. the monsters, yeah, they add on deck, all the monsters and all the base, uh, components also have a deck of cards you can you can get. Those are like tarot sized, really high quality printed cards. So I love them. Um, but yeah. again, that's it's you know we we try to keep the games cheap because we mm -hmm. again we want to make these accessible, right? Like it's not we're not doing this for a living. We're we're doing this because we we have a passion for these games and want to make fun games people enjoy playing. Yeah. Well, I'm personally glad that you came on the show and talked to us about this. I uh, I'm really excited to play it. Uh, we just, Jason, and I just need to find some time to get together yeah, and, yeah. and put it on the table, break, but I'll break uh, out my army men. That's right. There you go. <laughs> that's right. I've got, uh, I've got some, um, veteran guardsmen from the death Corps of Krieg that I think would fit this model very well. Right. Perfect. So, yeah. I'm looking forward. I'm looking forward to, to putting those out and I've got some orcs that we could use as monsters. Why not? Right. There you Perfect. go. So, yeah, all right. Cool. But uh, yeah, Vince, thank you so much for uh, coming on. Do you have any parting thoughts that you would like to give our audience before we before we close down? No, check out the site. Check out the game. I've got battle reports on my channel on YouTube. Adam also has information on it on his channel on Tabletop Minions. My channel is just under Vincent Venturella. Um, you can follow me on Twitter at Warhammer Weekly. Um, that'll, you know, sort of, if you want to I, I share pictures of miniatures and whenever we're doing videos and, and stuff, information about the games and we're working on all those kinds of things. But I just want to thank you both for having me on. It was an absolute pleasure. Lots of fun yeah. to just sit here and nerd out with both of you. Yeah. <laughs> we yeah, love it. This coming. is, yeah, this is why we do the show just to nerd out. So it's good times. So thank you so much again. And, uh, everybody who's interested, check out the links, uh, in the description below. They'll take you everywhere that Vince was talking about. So Thank you so much, and uh, we'll see you all at the tables. Have a good night. See ya.